<laughs> Thanks for showing up. Uh, I've had an interesting career in photography, uh, mostly technical work. I started in photo labs and somehow found myself running NASA's photo section at the Langley Research Center and discovered that I'm unfit for working with bureaucracy. <laughs> so, something that I felt uh, le leaving in my mid-30s, I thought that might have been a career mistake, but I was so glad I did. Um, but I, I've always taken photos for a hobby, and I've done a lot of news stringer, a lot of work with news, newspapers over the years. Uh, but in 2012, I said, you know, I've always wanted to do nature photography, and if I don't get around to it, I never will. So I went out and I invested in the lenses and the kayak and blinds and all the gizmos. And uh, invested is the right word. I often set sail with something like $24,000 worth of camera gear in my kayak. But when I got started, when, when I got started, I was hoping for uh, two shots of loons. I wanted a shot with the, uh, the babies on the back and one with a nice wing stretch. So we're about 250,000 shots later. Uh, <laughs> well, it will. So what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to tell you more about loons than you probably ever thought you wanted to know. Okay. And then we're going to follow a loon family through the season, through the, from uh, when the parents arrive back in the spring. It's actually a composite of families across three lakes over several years. The timeline is correct, and we'll see how the chicks develop. And then to close out, I started this to make some pretty pictures. So I've got some pretty pictures that didn't fit elsewhere in the program. So we'll close out with a few of those just to show you what I was after. But let's see what we've got. Let's take an uncommon look at the common loon. And, okay. Sounds sad. It does. <laughs> The whales are communication. They're thought it was over. <laughs> okay, they use them to communicate between the two of them, and it's a territorial call. They're telling the world that this is their pond, and to uh, stay away. Okay. So it, uh, it's what I started with. So 250,000 shots later. Okay, so about the fourth time, oh, actually, no, this is the very first time I went out in my brand new kayak with my brand new camera gear. And I had gone out and I'd bought a bunch of PVC pipe and camouflage cloth, thinking I was going to have to make myself a little floating blind. But I just went out one spring morning, and or I guess it would have been later in the season when I bought the kayak, but I just paddled across the pond, and the loons on the pond came over to see what I was up to. And they just swam up and stretched for me. Okay, but st stay with me. I think we got a little better. Okay, on the, about the fourth trip out, I ran into this guy. And if you look closely right at the uh, base of his neck, you see a lead sinker. He's wrapped up in fishing line. He was still able to dive and catch food, but he was obviously disturbed by it. So I, he was in New Hampshire, so I got home and I called the fish and wildlife folks. And they said there's an outfit called the Loon Preservation Committee down in Moultonboro. And so, okay, I went down and I, uh, I called the Loon Preservation Committee. And if anybody dealt with loons in New Hampshire, you may recognize the name John Cooley. John lost the coin toss, and they dragged him to the phone. And he, he was very kind. We had a wonderful chat. And I told him about the loon. And he said, well, you know, if he's diving, we have a real hard time catching him. He goes, keep an eye on it. If it gets worse, we'll try to do what we can. And then he was saying, well, you know, if you're out there anyway, we, we like to know when the loons come back in the spring and when they nest and when the chicks hatch. And, you know, if you could just send us an email after trips where you see something, I said, that's easy enough. Okay, I can do that. And, you know, he thought I was agreeable, so he, he went a little further and asked, to, you know, we put out nesting signs to warn people away from the nests. It, you know, if you're out on the ponds anyway, you mind taking a sign out and putting them out in front of the nest? <laughs> and, you know, 
okay, that can't be too big a deal. You know, it goes out once, it comes in once a year. I could probably do that. But I'd been a Rotarian long enough to recognize that I had to get off the phone or I was going to be president of this thing. Um, but I, I managed to get off the phone, um, and I suspect John hung up thinking, oh, my goodness, I got a new volunteer. Great. Well, I've been a very expensive volunteer. They've been very, very kind at answering questions and helping me out. A, a few years back, they took me out banding loons. They go out at night in a Boston whaler, and you shine a light at the loons, and they'll come over to see what you're up to, and you grab them in a net. And let me tell you, if you've got four people and a really angry 17-pound loon in a Boston whaler, it's a very small boat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, here I am holding one of the chicks while the parents are getting banded. Uh, yes, that's loon poop. Not every guy looks good in loon poop, but I, I think I've got the savoir faire that lets me pull it off. Okay, well, let's figure out what a loon is anyway. Uh, they're in their own family. They're uh, the genus of Gavia. Uh, they're primitive aquatic birds. The real distinguishing feature to them is how far back on their body their legs are. Their closest relatives are penguins, and their legs are almost as far back as you'd find on a penguin. Okay, this allows them to swim well and fly well, but they have real trouble walking. Their legs aren't under them, so they're pushing from behind. But uh, that's where they get their name. They're very clumsy on land. Depending on whether you were English or Scandinavian, you claim that the word loon comes from your language. The, the root of the original words was both loony, crazy, because they, they stagger on land like, uh, yeah, as if they were drunk or something. Okay, they're very powerful flyers. Okay, they can cruise 70 miles an hour or so. And they really cover distances. They put a tracker on one and got them doing 670 miles in a day. Okay. Uh, and they make a neat sound. They get, they get a shh, 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 shh that you can hear at a distance. And to me, it sounds like a guy walking very briskly in his brand new corduroys. <laughs> but, uh, loons need a long runway to take flight. And they run across the surface of, whoop, they run across the surface of the water. Each of those splashes is where a foot came down. Okay, and they'll take off into the wind to get the extra lift. And they make quite a show when they're, when they're going trying to take off. And on the ponds in New England, uh, particularly one of the ponds I watch, actually two of the three, have very steep hills close in. And to gain altitude, they'll frequently have to make several orbits to get enough altitude to climb up over the hills. So it's neat when they go running down the pond, I turn around to watch to see if they might come back at eye level. It you know. sounds like gliding or soaring. When a plane hits, goes over right. a, uh, a shopping mall, it just circles up to 10,000 feet. Yeah, uh, a, plane, uh, a glider would get lift. Th these guys are working very hard to provide their own lift. Okay, uh, jumping ahead a little bit. Most birds have hollow bones to make them lighter so they can fly easier. Loons actually have solid bones, or filled bones, more like human bones, um, which makes them heavier, which makes it wonderful for diving. But it, uh, loons are big birds. Uh, we'll get to the stats in a minute, but yeah, the, average, the average loon in uh, New Hampshire, or something like, the average male loon is something like 17 pounds. Wow. So they're, they're turkey size. And here, uh, when they're flying, <laughs> my timing's off. <laughs> okay, they call that a tremolo call. That's a uh, warning to other loons that they're coming or going. And uh, if a loon flies over an occupied pond, Frequently, uh, both the fly guy flying overhead and the, and the pair on the pond will yell at each other with that. Yeah. Loons are very good swimmers. They cruise along the surface of the water up to about 10 miles an hour if they're, 
if they're motivated. I've seen a lot of estimates that say they can swim 50 miles an hour underwater. What I haven't found is anybody that says, we went out and measured and found the bird. <laughs> but 50 miles an hour seems to be a reasonable estimate. They, they move right along. If you can see one, if you get clear water and can see one going. Uh, again, somebody says they can dive to 250 feet. I haven't found anybody that says we actually went down to 250 feet to wait for the loon to come down. But um, they can stay under for five minutes, and it may even be longer. Um, if you go out and see loons on a lake, don't chase them. If you annoy them, they will disappear for the five minutes and pop up three quarters of a mile down the pond. Okay. Uh, of course, you never know where they're going to come back up. I was watching our chick, and here's one of the parents surfacing with breakfast. Now, hey, where do we find them? We're at the very southern edge of the breeding territory. In, uh, um, I think actually in, in Newbury, I'm pretty close to the southern edge. Actually, I think in Woodstock, I'm probably gotten a little south of their breeding territory. But they breed across, uh, all across North America, then across Northern Europe. Over in Europe, they become uh, northern divers rather than loons. <coughs> and they need a forested pond. They like lots of jagged shorelines with lots of brush. And they love little hummocks. And one of the things they desperately need is a pond with a stable water level. Okay. They're going to build their nest just a few inches above water level so that they can get up out of the water onto it. And if that means if the water rises just a little bit, their eggs wash out. And if the water gets too far down, they may not be able to make the climb to the nest. So you won't find them nesting on rivers because the rivers will change their height considerably more than a pond. Um, but they, they like forested ponds. With, uh, with hummocks. Okay, how big are they? In New England, the, uh, they're 15, 16 pounds for the males. Uh, in theory, the males are about 25% bigger than the females. The first family I started, show, the family, the, the first side I show you, uh, that was the male on the pond. He and I have become friends. Uh, when I put in the pond, he will actually come across the pond and come over and have a conversation with me. Um, and he was about two inches smaller than the female that was on the pond when I started following him. So if I could see them together, I could tell who was who. We lost the female in 2017. Uh, she got into a fight with a, a goose over, they had their nests in the same neighborhood, and they got into a fight, and the loon didn't make it. Um, and the new female <coughs> is just about the same size as the male. Um, there are a couple of ways you can tell them apart. Only the males yodel. Uh, I think we've got a yodel coming up. And then if you can happen to, if you happen to catch the mating, uh, you can tell who's who. Loons in the middle of the country are about 30% smaller than the loons on the coast. That's probably due to the longer migration. Loons in New England will winter in the Atlantic, <coughs> most of them. They, they don't read the book, so there are always a few that don't get the message. <laughs> But most of our loons will go to the Atlantic somewhere between Cape Cod and Maine. So from central New Hampshire, as the crow flies, that's a pretty short, that's an afternoon's adventure. If you're in Minnesota, and a uh, few years ago I found myself in, in uh, Clifton, Arizona, right on the Mexican border. And I, uh, when I got to town, I stopped at the Chamber of Commerce in the old... Uh, the old railroad station, and it was a, it was on the river. It was a big pool in the, in the a little lake in the river, right behind the Chamber of Commerce. And I walked into the Chamber of Commerce, and right there was a huge mural, of their pair of loons that comes every winter. So if you're if you're in northern Minnesota and you're going to the Mexican border, that's considerably longer than hopping over to, the Atlantic. But, uh, they are big birds. They're 30 inches, give or take, from the tip of their bill to their tail feathers. And their wingspan is about four feet. Wow. They are 
very big birds. Okay. Their schedule in Vermont and New Hampshire, they'll come back at the end of April. And they're known for reappearing within hours or at most a couple of days of when the ice is out on their pond. How they know is beyond me, but they know. Okay. Most of our loons in New England will nest in late May, uh, which means the chicks will hatch the third week of June. But there's some flexibility there. One year, one of the pairs I followed didn't nest until the second week of July. Uh, but that was, that was noticeably late. Okay. Our adults will stay on their pond into September, or possibly early October. Okay. The chicks, the, the adults will leave for the winter first, and the chicks will follow a week or ten days later. Now, as we watch the, uh, the loon chicks grow up, I'll point out why I think the uh, parents leave early. Okay. Um, the parents seem to pair up as long as they're successful at raising chicks together. If you don't produce chicks, your mate's likely to toss you overboard. Um, here we have them. This is a pair that's arrived back on their pond. They're looking for a uh, nesting spot. They're going to explore the shoreline almost all the, all the way around the pond. Okay. Uh, the literature says the male chooses the nesting site. This pair found several places that they thought were prospective nesting sites. Both of them crawled out of the water and sat on the nest and looked around and they talked about it and then they moved on to try the next one. So I, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm about to repaint my kitchen. I will physically pick up the paint at the paint store, but you don't think I'm going to have the choice of what the color is. So it may be the same, same thing. Um, they're, they're, he's looking around. I thought they were going to take this hummock. They actually took one uh, uh, 25 feet to the west or so. But they uh, explore. Okay. And here's one of those signs that the Loon Preservation Committee wrote me into uh, setting out for them. And th this is Dad on this pond. And he does not seem impressed with this sign. He's looking at me with a, what are you doing? But uh, that's out trying to keep their nest safe. And here's, when they're ready to mate, they'll actually crawl out on the shore. They mate on shore. Many times it's actually on the nesting site. Uh, this couple, th th this couple makes sure they're going to have chicks. Uh, they've got two beaches they like and the nesting site. Now, new loon nests aren't really great architectural wonders. They're shallow cups that they'll build up a little bit. Uh, this one's digging up, uh, it looks like, uh, the roots for vegetation. And they're going to pull it up. And they're sitting on the nest and we're placing the, placing this. It's just going to be enough so that the eggs don't roll away. Okay. Uh, they'll lay one or two eggs. About every 200 clutches, there'll be a third egg. But raising two chicks is a lot, a lot of work. A family of four loons will eat something like 1,000 pounds of protein over the summer. So when you, the loon chicks are born at an ounce or two ounces, and they've got to be something like five or six pounds by the end of the summer if they're going to survive the winter. So in three months... They're going to go from two ounces to five pounds, so they uh, voracious. How big are the eggs? Uh, goose egg size. Uh, all birds turn their eggs uh, several times a day. They, the suspicion is that it, it does two things. One, it would help distribute the nutrients to the uh, growing chick. And the second, it probably helps keep the uh, chick from adhering to the egg. So they, uh, the loons both take turns sitting on the nest, and they, they call it a nest exchange. Uh, often the loon on the nest will come off, and the two loons will spend some time together preening and fishing. And then somebody will get back on the nest, and either on the way in to sit the eggs, or after they get up on the nest, they'll be there a minute or two, they'll 
they'll stand up and roll the eggs. Uh, it's thought that the female takes more nest time as they get closer to hatching. One of the pairs that I've been following the last several years, the male is banded so I can tell them apart. Dad is a much more devoted parent. And dad's been on the nest every time the chicks have hatched over the last four years. So when, once again, I don't, don't know if my loons aren't reading the book that tells them that how it's supposed to work. or if, you know, um, Here we see a loon that's stressed. Okay, she's on the nest, and I'd been floating along. Like I'm working with the, the big, big lenses, so I'm back something like 120 or 30 feet. And she's been ignoring me. And all of a sudden, she flattened out. And after a minute looking around, I discovered that an otter had surfaced not far from the nest. So she was trying to hide from the otter. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of threats to loons before they can get to uh, raising their chicks. One of the things that is uh, one of the real threats is territory disputes. The loon population in New England through the conservation efforts, the loon population is way, way up. When the uh, Vermont Center for Echo Studies started tracking loons, they found 69 loons in the, the uh, state of Vermont. In this last year, we had something like 380 pair nesting. So it's been very successful. Uh, same sort of numbers in New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont's catching up, but New Hampshire's ahead of them. They've been building floating nests they, they make just a little raft, with, they put some vegetation on it, and then they put a, a, a screen up over top to protect it from eagles and hawks. And the, they seem to add a webcam to many of them. Uh, if you go to loon.org, you can follow along. They'll have webcams on several. Uh, but since the uh, loon preservation started doing this 30-some-odd uh, years ago, one in four chicks in New Hampshire has been hatched on a floating nest, which that, that's an inexpensive, repeatable, and easy to handle conservation. So that it's wonderful stuff. But uh, so what we're seeing now is that we're getting to the point where we have almost as many loons as territories. So we're seeing more and more fights, okay, and they're serious about it. Um, the young loons that don't have a territory have to chase somebody off a territory to get it. If you're chased off a territory, you've got to go chase somebody else off of territory. Okay. Uh, we think that it's usually, if, it, if there's one intruder, they're usually fighting with the loon of the same sex to drive them off. And if they succeed, usually the remaining loon on the pond will accept them as their new mate. So they get a mate and a territory. Uh, Sometimes you see pears that got run off their lake that come and will challenge. And uh, the, yeah. What do they eat? What, what we, uh, fish and cray, yeah, fish and crayfish, what protein. Well, we'll, we'll show, show you more in just a minute here. Um, while they're, uh, there's a, the loon org, uh, oh, it's uh, looncenter.org out in uh, the upper Midwest. They've been tracking, they've got hundreds of birds banded now, and they've been tracking them, and they think that loons are smart enough to pay attention to the territories in the neighborhood to see who's successful, and will come back and challenge a pair on a lake that's been successful for several years. But, um, okay, so they, challenges can take hours, days, weeks. Uh, hopefully, they get settled when one loon gets chased off without anybody getting hurt. Uh, they will fight, and they can fight. They can escalate to the point where somebody kills another. Uh, in 2018, one of my ponds, I'd been up several mornings in a row and seen the the pair fighting off an intruder. Uh, I missed a day and went back and found the female dead. Um, the loon preservation committee has a deal to. Uh, at that point, it was uh, Tufts University that was doing the necropsies for them. And this loon had been stabbed, uh, probably with the bill of another loon. Um, so they will get fighting. So they start, they circle, they circle each other, 
I, I say this is the trash talking at the bar. They're <laughs> circling each other and hooting and sizing each other up. Okay, the home team will come out. Oops. Home team comes out. And they, they circle for a while. Okay. If you can't tell them to go away with your stare, you start trying to show them how big you are. Okay, I'm a big, tough loon. I'm much too big for you to handle. Go away. And the next step, which they have to worry about when they get uh, fighting, since they dive and swim so well, you have to worry about watching the basement. Okay, the, a lot of the fighting goes on underwater, and if they're swimming along, if they are getting up to 50 miles an hour, if they get you with that bill, it's likely to be fatal. But uh, here we've got they call this a yodel. Only the males do. So if you're watching loons on your pond and one of them's yodeling, you know who's who. Okay, that's a okay. We're gonna fight and. You know, come what may. Okay, so we've, he's warned them off. They didn't go. He's showing them that he's bigger and tougher and meaner. Okay. One dove while the other is posturing. And here's the penguin dance. You can see how far back on the body the legs are there. He's standing up. He's supporting himself by running in place and flapping. This is a seriously ticked off loon. This is a. Um, this is telling the other loon that if I catch you, you're going to die. Okay, and then a lot of the fight is underwater. There's actually two loons here. There's one in the center that's just underwater, and the loon on the on the uh, on the right is uh, hitting him. What well, the first stage of a fight is usually wing rowing. They go scurrying across the pond somebody chasing the other, and they're propelling themselves with their wings, and they're, they, they get going right along, 30, 35 miles an hour would be my guess, and so now you'll see a loon presentation where somebody says estimated at 30 or 35 miles an hour, but no. Uh, so they're, they're fighting about property? Yeah, they're fighting, yeah, they want the territory, and they're, they're trying to displace the loons on the territory, and they like to wait until the chicks have just hatched. When the chicks are the most vulnerable, they will kill the chicks if, on the assumption that if the home team doesn't have chicks to raise, they're, they've lost some of their incentive for hanging on to the property. But they will race across the pond as we get catching up. This is actually great for photos. They, they cover a lot of ground and they circle. and they, they just don't care where the boat is. They'll come and go right by me. And I think this was the challenge of when it. Will they only fight if there's a shortage of territory, or I yeah. like yours better? I like yours better is enough. Um, <laughs> but they pro somebody will probably back down if they know there are other territories. But, you know, they don't read the book. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. Uh, um, I think this was a challenger, and uh, this. Uh, Looks to me like he's realized he's made a horrible mistake. <laughs> he's, he's being chased. And I think, I think this was a pair of males. The home team, if I've got it right, they, they all wear the same uniforms. Yeah. I've been talking to the preservation guys. Couldn't you give them little pin so I could tell who's who? <laughs> but, um, yeah, the guy in the black and white's caught the guy in the black and white. Um, but, yeah, he's got him around the neck, and he's trying to drown him. And... They worked at it, and they also have their elbows on their wings, have a very solid joint, and they use that for punching. So it's uh, pretty vicious. Uh, in this fight, I was convinced that the uh, the guy on top had actually drowned the the loon that was losing. Um, 
there was a lot of commotion, and then I lost track of one. And the, the uh, half an hour or so later, he popped out from under some brush and made an escape. A few days later, I was back on the pond, and there was another challenger. Same one, probably, but I have no way of proving it. Um, and that time, he got chased up 25 or 30 feet up on the lawn of one of the camps along the edge of the, of the pond. Um, when the two remaining went down the pond, he eventually flapped his way back down to the lake, took off, and I didn't see him back that season. So, but it's, uh, there are lots of other threats. Adult loons are big enough so they're safe for most, most mammals, except for man. Uh, they, they are big enough. There was a case a couple years back in Maine where an eagle went after a chick, and the male on the pond got so mad that he was able to stab and kill the eagle. So they will defend themselves. Uh, sea otters, if you're someplace where uh, you've got uh, uh, no, our river otters probably wouldn't take an adult loon if he's very hungry and he thinks he's got the surprise, maybe. But uh, eagles probably aren't going to go after an adult loon. For one thing, they'd have trouble lifting it if they caught it. But, uh, they will go after chicks. There are lots of things that will go after chicks. Uh, uh, let's see, we got raccoons, skunk, mink, fox. And when the chicks hatch, uh, snapping turtles. Uh, ravens, eagles, herons, fox, yeah, and then uh, even fish. Bass and pike will go after them. Um, oh, here's, I was watching, uh, uh, I, I follow three ponds and blog about them, and to give the loons some privacy, I, I call the loons on the easternmost pond the Eastons, and on the westernmost pond the Westons. And then, of course, that leaves us with the Middletons. Um, these are the Middletons. This is the pond where Dad is my buddy. Um, not sure who was on the nest, but our, we have a loon just snoozing one morning. I'm floating around waiting for something to happen, and the otter pops up. Uh, our loon very quickly woke up, and both loons were, they were swimming in a search pattern looking for the otter underneath to drive him away from the nest. Um, here's a, we had, uh, the Eastons had two geese with a single gosling, and most of the time they ignored each other, but every once in a while something would get them going. And this morning, the geese were off minding their own business, and this is Dad, uh, Easton. He dove, and he swam, I don't know, maybe about a quarter mile, and he popped up right in front of that goose, the goose family. He comes out of the water with his wings up and making a racket. And I will give this goose all the credit in the world standing ground while its mate and the chick and the gosling manage to escape. But if you look at the size of them, the loon's goose size. Here's, uh, actually this is not somebody going after the, uh, going after the, not the loon going after somebody. Here's a wood duck, mama wood duck. Mm -hmm. Ducklings are protein. A loon will take a duckling. Mm -hmm. And wood ducks would, will try to draw predators away from their ducklings. They go scurrying across the water and they drag a wing as if, it's, if, as if they're hurt. And they sort of spin and they make a lot of, they flutter a lot so they catch attention. And usually the idea is that the predator will go after the perfectly healthy duck away from the chicks, away from the ducklings, and then, then the duck just takes off. Um, this duck tried to draw the loon away from the duckling several times, and the loon wasn't having any of it. So the duck went right in and went after the loon. And, uh, the loon is four times the size, but uh, the loon actually retreated, which is a little surprise. Okay, and then here we are. We're back to our, our nest. They've beaten off all the threats so far. This is a warm afternoon. Loons will pant like a dog. They open up their mouth and breathe through their mouth. It's cool like a dog would. Okay, now we're up to what you came for. Here are our chicks. The eggs are laid a day apart, and so the chicks will hatch a day apart. 
and loons have different strategies. Sometimes a family will take the first chick out of the nest and one adult will go off with the first chick and start uh, raising it. Sometimes they wait for the second chick to hatch and then immediately pop out of the nest. Uh, the, that's the Middleton strategy. As soon as the last chick hatch, if they've got a second chick, as soon as the second chick is out, within 15 or 20 minutes they take off and they don't go back to the nest. Uh, these are the Eastons. This is Dad. If you look way back on his body, there's a bright green spot right down by the grass. That's the band on his back leg, so I can tell who's who. Um, but Dad has kept them in the, they, the last several years, they've timed it perfectly. They hatch Friday and Saturday, and Sunday morning, Dad has still got them in the nest. Okay, but Within uh, 10 minutes or so of my getting that photo, they left the nest, and once they leave the nest, they're done with it. The chicks will stay on the water the rest of the uh, season. They get right to work. Here are the chicks. One of the chicks is washed back up on the on the uh, rock from the wash when Dad got in the water. Dad's already looking. They're going to start feeding them. They get a lot of insect larvae when they're small and tiny fish, first year fish, and uh, really tiny crayfish. That, that's what they'll start with. Um, here's our here's our pair of uh, here, uh, yeah, they, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, notice they're sort of round, they aren't elongated like an adult, and notice their bill is stubby, and you can actually see the uh, egg tooth uh, dropping down on the, the very end of the, the uh, bill, that's what they use to help crack the egg, um, and they're covered in down, and they're about the size of a ping pong ball at this point. Um, and they're the cutest little, little buggers. Wow, really yeah, and covered in down, they can't dive, so they are defenseless. It's up to the parents to watch them. Okay, this is the same family. This is one of the first meals afloat. I think that was mom, and that looks like a. I'm not sure if that's a fish larvae or really tiny, tiny crayfish, but um, it takes a lot of work in the. When the chicks are this size, the parents are almost continuously feeding them until the chicks take a nap. And they keep coming. Here's a, we've got a little crayfish there. And here's, that's dad watching in the back and mom coming in with a, another crayfish. This is the pair. If I show up on the pond and there's only one adult with the chicks, it's dad 99% of the time. Mom puts the chicks on her back, gets bored, stands up, stretches, tosses the chick, and goes swimming off on her own. Uh, but yeah, mom spends a lot of time on her own, and dad does a lot of the raising. But uh, it's a full-time job. And then when they're not feeding them, when they're small, they tuck them either on board up on their back or under a wing. Hey, this would help keep them warm. It keeps them close to protect them from threats. And if they're on the back, it eliminates threats from snapping turtles and fish. And I, I should have titled this one, oh, another one. When I show this, uh, when I show a print, people will stare at it for a minute until they see the one under the wing and then you hear, oh, another one. Hey, but the, uh, the, the wings are designed for protecting the chicks. And the, the chicks are the cutest little things at this point. Okay, now we get to be a week old. You can see the chick is already noticeably bigger. It's more than doubled in size. Okay, and here's the, the pair of them. Now they're actually rivals. It's unlikely that they're gonna actually go at each other, but they have no interest in sharing meals or protect if they can if they can protect themselves or feed themselves they're going to if one of the chick fails to thrive the other one may badger it and the parents may abandon it if they think it's not going to make it but here now the biologists tell us we can't 
really can't assign human emotions to loons. I'm not a biologist, so that's just a proud parent. <laughs> okay, here's, I think that's mom coming in with a, it uh, looks like a little bass. A little bass. And, uh, the Eastons are very fond of crayfish. Whether that's a function of a lack of fish in the pond or whether it's a taste preference, no idea. But uh, all the families you'll see, it's hard to see the adults eating fish. They usually eat the fish underwater. Occasionally they'll have to bring one up and reposition it so they can swallow it. Uh, crayfish have to come up to the surface. They want to swallow them tail first. So they'll come up, they'll bring them up. Here's, I think that was dad handing off the crayfish again. When the chicks are very young, the parents come up and hold the food out and the chick takes it from their bill. As we get in a couple of weeks, the parents will come up and show the chick the food and then drop it and make the chick catch it. And the parent keeps an eye. Um, some, sometimes a poor crayfish or fish gets caught five or six times before it's <laughs> dispatched. But, oh, yeah, and being a loon chick is a very tiring business. <laughs> he's going to yawn, he's going to settle in. And Dad's encouraging to uh, come aboard for a nap. Okay. At this point, the usually only one parent at a time is diving. So there's always a parent on the surface watching, and they stay within just a few yards of the chick. Uh, as we go through the summer, the chicks will get more independent. Um, and sometimes it looks like it's just fun being a chick. <laughs> okay, now we get to two weeks old. And you can see their, their bill's just a touch longer. It's, it's not noticeable yet, but they're much, much bigger. Here they are compared to, uh, I think that's dad again. Yeah, that is dad, I can see. Um, and, you know, they started at ping pong ball size, and that's, they've grown a lot. And they're beginning to get longer. This also lets you see how far back their legs really are. Okay, and they're discussing something. Okay, and then loons will stretch a leg. They'll bring it out in a way, they call it a foot wave. I've seen it described as being a way to cool down. I don't know if I'd buy that because water would be a better conductor of heat than air, but they do it. Um, there doesn't seem to be any social significance to it. It looks like a stretch. But this poor little guy has to grow into that foot before the end of the summer. And, and Sometimes you get the directions from Ikea wrong. We, we're stretching a leg and a wing at the same time. Okay. And towards the end of the second week, they start standing up to stretch. And if we look underneath the uh, bottom of the wings, you can see that they're just beginning to grow their flight feathers. We'll watch those through the summer. They're just beginning to grow. And, of course, siblings of any species... You know, if you get a chance to kick your brother when you're pretending to stretch, that's fine. <laughs> okay, and we're, we're still bringing, in this pair, Mom would bring little tiny morsels, and Dad would bring the biggest, biggest piece of food that he thought the chick could manage to struggle down. Um, Here we're handing off another crayfish. And Dad is going to drop that right in front of the chick at this point. Okay, now we're up to three three weeks old. Oops, no we're not. Now we're up to three weeks old. Notice how much longer they are? Notice that their bills are beginning to elongate. And just underneath their, on their, on their bottom jaw, you can see their downs beginning to, to fall off. It'll be replaced by... Uh, uh, their winter plumage by the end of the year. Uh, at this point, they've caught on that food exists and somebody has to find it, and they're beginning to explore themselves. They still can't dive. At this point, they can just about get the body under before it pops back up from the down. Um, and here's one that we've corralled a stick. And 
turns about, sticks aren't all that tasty, apparently. <laughs> but after several tries, he gave up on it. But the parents will teach them to forage. They've taken them into very shallow water here. It's in the reeds. It's, uh, and it must be dad again. He's watching the chick. The chick is sticking his head down and chasing food uh, that way. And dad's watching him and probably nudging food his way. Uh, the other one is waiting his turn. We got, the parents are still feeding them. And here you can see, here's mom in the foreground with a tiny little morsel. And Dad just wants to get the job done. <laughs> okay, this is the, uh, we're up to four weeks old. There's a crayfish. And notice Dad isn't getting right up to the chick now. He's going to drop the crayfish there a couple inches from him. Um, here's a fish that was dropped several times before the chick managed to round it up. Uh, actually, I guess he's got it. And he's lost it. And notice dad is keeping an eye on it. But uh, the chick was able to recover it. That, that's a uh, brook trout. Uh, what do you think it costs New Hampshire Fish and Wildlife to stock a uh, brook trout? <laughs> you know, is that a 10 or $12 meal? <laughs> okay, and here's uh, dad managed to get the chicks filled up, and he'd got a nice fish that the Chicks wouldn't take, so Dad got to have breakfast. Okay, and then they uh, just slurp them down. They, they line them up so they go head first, and then just swallow them whole. And oh. yeah, and it's a, here we're stretching again. Uh, doesn't really let us see the uh, flight feathers, uh, but it, it seems like at this point they're beginning to figure out that they're going to do something with the wings. They're a long, long way from being able to lift, but they're beginning to seem to experiment with them. And at five weeks old, same, same story. They're getting bigger. Their bills are elongating. They're stretching their body. And you can see around their eye and behind their eye, they're getting a little spotty. It's a down dropping off. But look how big they've gotten in five weeks. Okay. And they're beginning to explore on their own. They can make very short dives at this point. But they've learned shallow water has food, and they're picking insect larvae off the, off the, and probably insects off the brush along the side of the pond. And here's another one that's managed to capture a stick, and he didn't care for them either. So they've, they're also beginning to figure out where the shallow water is. This is a pile of rocks. Um, it's a tiny little island, but the loon chicks have learned that that's where you can find shallow water, water that they can reach down and, and search. Okay. The parents are still doing most of the feeding. Okay. We've got a crayfish. The crayfish objected to being eaten. So the, uh, <coughs> I suspect it got a, got a pincher on the tongue, and so the chick tossed it. It was a valiant effort by the crayfish, but he got rounded up. And, and then... Uh, we're stretching more, and look on the bottom side of the wings, the black, the flight feathers growing in, and they're beginning to get serious about them. And at six weeks, the splotches on their back have lost their down, and that's their uh, their adult feathers growing in, and up on top of their head. Okay, we've got another one with a crayfish. And the crayfish is uncooperative again. But they, they tracked it down and got it. And it, by the time they're teenagers, they're really beginning to pester their parents to be fed. They'll come up and they'll grab the feathers. They like to get around the head and neck. They will actually pinch and tug on the feathers. Hey, if they can't get the neck, they're going to go for the tail feathers. And this gets worse as the season goes on, and the parents spend much less time on the surface. They'll show up, give the meal, and dive again immediately to get away from this. And I am convinced this is why the parents take off a week before the chicks. They've just had enough. <laughs> but they, uh, both of them will go at you. And uh, you can see the feathers are coming in. The one here on the left, he's got the uh, feathers along his back, and the other one, he's coming. Uh, and at this point, as their feathers start growing in, they have to start preening. 
Okay, they've got to clean all of their feathers every day. And then like other waterfowl, they have a gland at the base of their tail that excretes a waxy sort of substance. That's what keeps them waterproof. Their down was waterproof, but their feathers aren't. So now they've got to learn to get the wax and wax all their feathers to stay waterproof. And here's a loon that there's a threat on the pond. We've actually got a challenger coming in to challenge the parents for the territory. The chicks can't do much. They can't fly. They can't <coughs> die for very long. So they hide. They just flatten out and try not to be seen. Uh, when the fight moved away a little bit, they got over by the brush. And as the fight came back up the pond, they disappeared up into the brush to protect themselves. And they all made it. As we go on at uh, seven weeks, you know, we're it, same story. We're continuing the bills a little longer, and you're seeing more feathers. And but it's still tiring business being a loon chick. They're doing more foraging on their own. They're beginning to make dives. They're down. 30 seconds, give or take, at this point. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what's edible. We tried a little salad this morning and uh, didn't care for it. But uh, Dad was ready to ready to help out. You didn't have to live with salad. And yes, the chick could handle it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty impressive sight. <laughs> I, I, I'm convinced that a six-inch long chick can actually swallow a nine-inch fish. They, uh, they, uh, they, uh, as we get a little older, just the down's just on the back of the head and neck there. They, the loons have a winter plumage where they're gray, they're light gray and dark gray, about the color of the North Atlantic, uh, and the chicks will grow into that scheme for in their first year. Oops. Okay, we're busy preening again, and they have to contort into all sorts of positions to get every feather. You know, we're working on our belly. And when they finish preening, they like to come up for a stretch. And here's one. We can see the uh, flight feathers again. They're getting bigger. We're still a little bit before we're ready to try flying, but we're coming. Here's nine weeks. He's three quarters the size of the adult and they're foraging on their own a little bit. Here we are nabbing insects or larvae off a, a piece of dead fall. The ears are hidden, is that right? Yeah, they, uh, they've got uh, little holes behind their eye but they're feathered over. There's no external ear. Yeah, and then we've got um, the parents are still feeding them. Uh, Okay, that's a crayfish. But the, the chicks are beginning to stand up and work their wings, probably to build up some strength. And you can see they're, they've got serious feathers underneath the wing now. They're real feathers. And this guy even tried to, tried to take off. He went scurrying down the pond, flapping for all he was worth. And uh, he, he's got a while before he can get up, but he was going for it, and he just looks very happy with himself. <laughs> hey, and notice even the down on his head is gone now. Yeah. You know, we're getting up. Um, okay, so as we finish out the rest of the season, uh, this is a crayfish that the, the chick himself dove and caught and brought up to the surface. They'll, they'll toss them in the air to like, get them so they line up tail first. Um, but even that wasn't enough. This was another one that the you know, crayfish objected and the loon tossed him and had to go catch him again. Here we are grabbing hold of, uh, yeah, this is the family where dad's the better parent, so I suspect that was dad. Um, more time working our wings, and again look at the bottom of the, the wings to see the feathers. And that gives a good view of the feathers, they're really working it. And they're beginning to run, they're trying to take off. I, uh, I follow, I post on my Facebook page, and I, I try to blog about the families every week. Uh, our part-time neighbor who lives down in Atlanta in the winter was down there. And uh, after several of these on posts on Facebook, 
he wrote and said, you know, there are people all over the world cheering those chicks on. <laughs> he, he was right. They, they, uh, I've developed a following here. We're making a real, real devoted effort. Okay, his body's out of the water. He's still running across the top of the water. He didn't take flight yet, but he's getting close. Here's another try. Once again, they're clear of the water, but just not quite there. And when they land, oops, when they uh, land, they come in and sort of like a snow plow when you're skiing, and you do the snow plow stop, you, you skid and turn. So he's, as he finishes up his run, he puts his belly down and he'll tip a wing and skid. So then at some point, the day comes and we've got a chick flying. Okay, so at this point, they now know how to feed themselves and how to preen and care for themselves, and now they've learned how to take off. Only one thing left. Uh, landing. landing. <laughs> we, we didn't get our nose up high enough. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he took a hard hit, but uh, it didn't do him any harm. And, and uh, not much later, they left the pond. And here's an adult loon down in Rye Harbor in the winter. This is their winter plumage. Uh, it's very good for hiding in the chop in the Atlantic. Um, and he's got a, a uh, crab. And the, the crabs are fussy about getting eaten, too. It's a, so. And then let's just close out with a few of my favorite photos. Uh, I, I just, the coloring on a loon is fairly subtle, but they've got beautiful, rich tones. They've got a a stripe of color around their neck and the, the bands on their neck. Um, I'm dreaming of finding somebody that uh, uh, has worked with barcodes and facial recognition. I'm willing to bet you that the loons are barcoded and if we could get somebody to do the computer program and we could tell who's who. Now this isn't much photographically, but spending a lot of time watching, it's hard to tell how intelligent a loon is. They don't do much that translates into intelligence. Um, birds are very sharp. Since I started paying attention, I, I noticed if I go out to fill my bird feeder, the chickadees will be right there waiting for me. They, they aren't at all concerned that I outweigh them, you know, 250 to six ounces. Um, but they will, and if you hold out your hand with some seed, they know they want the seed, but they're smart enough. They do a cost-benefit analysis and then they design the experiment to see if you're after them. They will come down and they will, you know, make a quick pass so you can't catch them. Then they'll come down and hover. And a couple of times they'll come down and just touch and go. And then when they're convinced that you're sincere, then they'll come down and land and take the seeds. And after, after they get away with it, then they're quick. But that shows a great deal of intelligence. They, they know that they want the seed, but there's a risk. And they test it. Um, this loon was fighting with a... I think this is the intruder, but once again, they're all wearing the same uniforms. Um, he'd been fighting with the two on the lake, and they had a skirmish, and he disappeared. And I was, uh, I'd broken off, and I was paddling up the side of the lake. And when I first saw him, he, the black and white was up against the, the birch, and his head was almost invisible against that shadow in the background. And I could think of three things. One, that he pick this spot entirely at random. This was just a good place to get off the pond and out of sight. Or two, we had some reason that I can't figure. But I'm pretty sure that he is smart enough to recognize that he's a loon and the other guy's a loon and he must look like the other guy. And he's black and white and hiding against the birch log is going to camouflage him and his head would disappear. I'm pretty sure that they were smart enough to do that. Can I prove it? No, but here... Some mornings I get up early, and the loons sleep in. <laughs> Come mid-July, we start getting uh, fog on all our ponds, which makes for all sorts of neat photos. And we got a, I'm a sucker for the wing stretch. Right? And here's a nicely lit wing stretch. And this is what I was thinking of when I got started. The, uh, you know, just a nice calm morning with a wing stretch. and Okay, I could use a smoother water for better reflection, but, you know, okay. And the other shot I wanted was the chicks on the back. 
Hey, I call this one, don't make me come back there. <laughs> yeah, there, uh, and then this is, uh, this chick is three or four days old. I think that's dad that he's riding on. I just love the little chick's attitude. Okay, you know here, this is the way the world works. Dad's taking me out to breakfast. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, I'm out on the water. I try to be out on the water about 40 minutes, 45 minutes before sun up. So in the long days of June, I really envy those guys that get to sleep in until 3 a.m. But when I get up on the pond, uh, one of these is way up in the White Mountain National Forest, and I'm probably the only person for five, six, ten miles in any direction. It, getting up is, uh, is well worth it. Yeah. That's one of our chicks off on his own. This is my favorite shot from last year. Oops, last year. This is dad with a couple of chicks. They've had breakfast, and now they're just snoozing. They're taking an easy morning. Oh, and here, here's mom off on her own. And sometimes they sleep in the fog. I told you that the uh, male on the, that we saw in the first picture, he is, mom had been feeding the chicks, and we'd been keeping 120, 30 feet distance, and Mom was unconcerned, and the parent, dad had been out getting dinner, and they came back and swapped so Mom could go get dinner. Dad took the chicks in, and he swam right over towards the boat. Just came over and lifted his wing. And, I, and have you met Junior? <laughs> um, and here's here's the other chick riding along in the back of Dad. And you can watch the the loon chicks pay. They, you know, they they have to watch their parents to learn how to be a loon, and uh, um, so you see them mimicking them. So, and here's a loon chick that's learning how to swim, how to swim in formation. He's he's it's, he's like he's healing. He's keeping a real close eye on dad. This is our male. That's my buddy. They've been feeding the chicks. The sun has actually dipped down behind the hill. It's still lighting the vegetation on the uh, and the leaves on the side of the lake. So. It, and then late in the fall, that was the last day that year that I saw the adult. I headed out shortly after that. And then we've got, if you want more information, um, the Vermont Center for Echo Studies here in Vermont. Um, anybody know Eric Hansen? No? Okay. Eric Hansen's Vermont's loon guy. Um, yeah, there. And... Uh, the Loon Project up in the upper Midwest has a real neat blog. If you're interested in birds, it's worth reading. Uh, they've been tracking loons. Uh, they've got one that uh, they banded 34 years ago. Uh, actually, Eric Hansen from here in Vermont was doing his internship when they uh, banded the loon up in uh, Minnesota, I think. What is the lifespan of loons? Uh, the oldest one we know of is 34, year, it was 34 years since it was banded. Uh, Vermont had one that was, uh, I think it was 29 uh, from the time it was banded. And they, you can't ban them as a chick, so they have to be an adult. How, how old it was when it was banded is the, the question. But um, if you want to follow me, um, I didn't put cards out. I'll figure out where I've got them. Uh, my website is cleverly disguised as ianclark.com. <laughs> Uh, I'm on Facebook at Upper Valley Photos and Instagram if you Instagram. And if you're savvy enough to read barcodes, <laughs> you can follow me with a barcode. And then uh, I've got some cards for sale in the back. They're $7 a piece. Um, it, I, I'll pay the tax uh, if you pay cash. If I have to get my credit card reader out, the credit card reader set to collect tax. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.